This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. I'm seated right now in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine, and I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. The day my mind is alert, my spirit is receptive, as I am taught the Word of God, my life is changed for the better, and I will never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. As you're being seated, if you would, turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 8. Those are the two primary passages we'll be in today. We've been walking through, first starting with the Gospels, learning and studying the miracles of the New Testament, learning the patterns and principles of those miracles so that we can live lives where our needs are met. We walk in the blessing of God and every benefit that Father God has for us. The ministry of Jesus was a ministry of compassion. And I'm going to begin in Matthew chapter 15, verse 29. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. He went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him. Because of the, the route that he had made, there were likely both Jews and Gentiles in this audience. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet. And he healed them. He healed them. So he had compassion. They brought to him the sick, the suffering, those that the only answer was a miracle from God. And Matthew tells us he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind sing. And they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or may they may collapse on the way. So he had compassion and he was concerned about their every need. And so in your heart, have the confidence to know that Father God and his son, they are concerned about your every need. Jesus, in fact, told us in Matthew's gospel that our Heavenly Father knows what we need even before we ask. God is a God of compassion. And when Jesus fed large crowds on two different occasions, he was concerned about their every need. And yes, that includes, he was concerned about them being well fed. He said, I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. Today, we come to the second miraculous feeding of a large crowd, 4,000 men plus women and children. But we will first go back and look at the first miraculous feeding, 5,000 men plus women and children. These were two separate events, but the principles are the same. And it's the principles, if you'll have eyes to see and ears to hear and not just agree with or believe, it's the principles that if you'll begin taking action on them, They'll change your life for the better. In Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In Matthew 6, 33, he said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto us. It's a lie of religion that Father God doesn't want us to have anything. It's a lie of religion that Father God wants us to be in need. It's a lie of religion that Father God doesn't want us to be able to afford anything. It's a lie of religion that, that, that God's best is that there only be enough to pay every bill, but when you're done paying every bill, there's just a cent left over, there's just a dollar left over, and there's nothing left over, so you have no ability to be a blessing. That's religion, but that is not the Bible. And so you have to come to the Word of God and see things from the perspective of God's Word. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What things? 
the things that people out there in the world, they spend all their time and focus and energy seeking after, putting first, lying, cheating, conniving, stealing, stepping on people, lying about people, all of the shenanigans that go on in the world, the things that people in the world put first. Jesus didn't say that we would do without food. He didn't say that we would do without clothes or provisions. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But it's not automatic. We have a part to play. If you look at 2 Corinthians 8 carefully, Paul says that Jesus Christ became poor so that we, through his poverty, we might become rich. You go to Galatians, the, the language of the Apostle Paul is very similar, that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law in order that we might walk in the blessing of Abraham. But the Bible is very specific that it's not automatic. We have a part to play. We have to do something. That's why Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given unto you. It'd be nice if it was just given unto us and we didn't have to do anything, but we have a part to play. Dr. Lester Sumrall, who went to be with the Lord in 1996, when he would come and minister, one of those occasions, he told my parents that if a man's not right with his money, that man isn't right. He told my father that if you don't have a man's money, you don't have his heart. Well, this lines up with what Jesus taught, because Jesus taught us that where a man's treasure is, there is his heart. If a man is in church year after year after year, but he doesn't tithe and give, his heart is not in the kingdom of God. He may be present, but his heart is not in the kingdom. If a man is not a blessing to his wife and to his children, his heart is not with his family. I remember once meeting with a young man, you know, and he, he, he approached me, well, I don't know what to do. And I said, all she wants you to do is to get a job, keep a job, and bring the paycheck home. It is not that complicated. So we have to do our part. And if we'll see from the word of God what our part is and do our part, we'll walk in the blessing of the Lord. And the path will be smoothed out before us. Now, this is a matter of the heart. The blessing of God, the prosperity of God, it is a matter of the heart. The purpose of biblical prosperity is so we can be a blessing. And that's why we say all the time that we are blessed to be a blessing. And Satan, the enemy, he doesn't want us to be blessed because he doesn't want us to have the ability to be a blessing. In the first covenant of the Bible, the Lord told Abraham, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing. So that's why we say, why don't we say, say I'm blessed to be a blessing. And if we're unwilling to be a blessing, that, that hinders what Father God can do in our lives. That, that hinders how much he can bless us because he's a good steward. And so if he blesses us and we're not a blessing, he'll see that. And when we, we're not used of him to be a blessing, we're unwilling to be a blessing, he, he'll distribute those resources somewhere else to someone who will be a blessing. We're blessed to be a blessing. But it's a matter of the heart. There are believers and they want to be blessed they want to have more than enough. They want to have plenty, but they don't want to be a blessing. And that's not how it works. Now, you have to set aside the religious, the wrong religious idea that God wants to diminish you. And someone might say, well, Austin, are there things that God does want us to give up? Yes, things that are unholy, things that are displeasing to him, things that are unrighteous, bad, bad habits, bad thoughts, bad, bad attitudes, bad actions. But if you give those things up, it's for your good. It's for your best. Every command is for your good. But, but in your life, you've got to set aside the religious mentality that God wants to diminish you. He doesn't want to diminish you. He wants to increase you. He wants to multiply you. So I say this, say, my heavenly father, he wants me to have more than enough. And so when we look at the two occasions when Jesus fed large crowds, we see the principles of multiplication, of not just enough, but more than enough. Number one, Jesus was not poor, and Jesus 
did not live broke. If you read the Gospels carefully, Jesus had a home. He, it's a hard to believe in 2023. I was about to say 2024. It's not 2024 yet. Jesus was not living with his mother in his 30s. Jesus had his own place. He had a home in Capernaum. And so it's a religious attitude. It's a religious mentality that Jesus and the disciples could not afford to eat at Taco Bell or Taco Casa. It's nonsense. And so you got to set all of that aside. Jesus was not poor and he did not live broke. Mark 6, beginning in verse 35. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. It's already very late. Send the people away. Now, now watch the language of the disciples very carefully. And to be fair, to be gracious, this was early on in the ministry of Jesus. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Send them away so they can go away and buy themselves something to eat. Notice, the disciples wanted the people to buy food for themselves. The disciples were not willing to use the money that had been donated to the ministry of Jesus to buy food for others. Send the people away so that they can buy themselves something to eat. But remember, we're blessed to be a blessing. The crowd was there. They had been listening to Jesus. They were hungry. The disciples said, send them away so they can buy themselves something to eat. A big part of prosperity is getting your heart right and having a right heart and right motives. You read James, you find out that motives have everything to do with answered prayer and the blessing of God. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. So there's a need. And what's his answer? You do something about it. You give them something to eat. They said to him that would take eight months of a man's wages. It's a large crowd, 5,000 men plus women and children. They said that would take eight months of a man's wages, even if it was Taco Bell. Still a lot of money, 5,000 men plus women and children. You throw teenagers in there, it's expensive. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? That would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? You know, I like all the Facebook posts about what a Corvette costs in the 60s. I like all the posts about, you know, back in the 50s, you could get a home for a certain amount of money. Those, those days are gone forever. Well, I remember when gas cost. Those days are gone forever. So you can be negative, you can complain, you can have a bad attitude, you can talk about the good old days, or you can come to the Word of God and learn how to believe God for more than enough in the days in which we're living. It's a choice. It is a decision. That would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much? Why don't we all say that? Say that much. Smile at your neighbor and tell them it costs what it costs. So there are mentalities that you have to set aside. You know, when Jessica and I got married to, to do a little trip, it cost what it cost, but that was 2006. It's, it's 2023. It costs more. You know, when we, we got married, nice car cost what it cost, but that was 17 years ago. They cost more today. And again, once these companies charge more and get more, they're not going to wake up tomorrow and say, oh, you know, let's charge less. So again, you have to decide. Are you going to be negative? Are you going to complain? Are you going to have a bad attitude? Are you going to take it out of your wife's hide or your children's hide and make everyone wear shoes that are too small? Or are you going to learn how to believe God? Are you going to learn how to apply the principles we see in the Word of God to have plenty and to have more than enough? Regardless of what religion has taught you, they had the money with them to buy food for 5,000 men plus women and children. We know from the Gospels that Jesus had a money bag. Jesus even had a thief for a treasure. 
Jesus also traveled with 12 grown men who in first century Judea would have been married and they would have had children. Imagine the overhead. Imagine the budget. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Tell your neighbor, say, they had the money. Tell your other neighbor, say, they had the money. Number two, when you walk with Jesus, not enough is not an excuse. When you walk with the Lord, when you walk with the ancient of days, not enough is not an excuse. Mark 6, 38, Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? They, he said, go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Everything that God does and every miracle of God begins with the seed. We learn from John's gospel that a boy had come prepared. A boy, I'm sure, with the help of his mother, had brought a lunch, five loaves and two fish. And he gave his lunch to Jesus. He sowed his lunch to Jesus. Every miracle of God, everything that God does begins with the seed. Number three, Jesus doesn't subtract or divide. Jesus multiplies. Even if every American gave all of their money, all of their assets, all of their wealth to the government, it would not be enough to cover the national debt. But let's say Americans were very generous and decided to do that. I'm, I'm teasing. Don't get nervous. It would be gone and wasted in a matter of weeks. See, man divides. Man subtracts. The government may divide. The government may subtract. But our great God, he multiplies. He increases. He takes what is not enough and he multiplies it into more than enough. But when you do things man's way or government's way, what is not enough is divided and subtracted until there's not enough for anyone. Jesus does not subtract or divide, he multiplies. Mark 6, verse 39, Jesus directed them to all to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he, he gave thanks. German pastor during World War II, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he once wrote that if you want God to bless you with the big things, you have to give thanks to God for the little things. You gotta give thanks to God for the little blessings every single day. So, so you may be believing God for this or that. You're not where you want to be. You're not yet eating where you want to eat, but you got to give thanks to God for what you're eating today. You got to give thanks to God for where you live today. You got to give thanks to God for every, every blessing today. Jesus broke the bread. He looked up to heaven and he gave thanks. He broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. They also divided the two fish among them all. And somebody might say, well, well, maybe he broke it up into little bitty pieces. Maybe he divided the fish into little bitty pieces. We'll see. That's not the case. All the gospel writers tell us that they ate and they were satisfied. They ate and there was plenty. They ate and there was more than enough. Jesus did not complain about what he did not have. He gave thanks for what he did have. That's faith. You're believing God for this or that. You desire this or that. But in the meantime, you give thanks with a grateful heart and for, with a grateful attitude for what you do have. And again, with all, with all this inflation, with all that's going on, you have to learn how to believe God. You have to learn how to walk by faith. You have to learn how to look to God as your source. Because there, there's no amount of couponing or any of that that you can do to make up for what the government has done. So you're going to have to believe God. You're going to have to learn how to walk by faith and not by sight. You're going to have to learn how to sit at the table with your family and give thanks for what you do have. Believing God to multiply it into what you want and into what you desire. He didn't complain about what he did not have. He gave thanks for what he did have. Number four Give your not enough to Jesus and live a life of plenty. Give your not enough to Jesus and live a life of plenty left over. Verse 42, they all ate and they were satisfied. I don't know if you've ever been with the young people for a basketball event or some event to CC's or one of those places. 
You know, picture a group of teens eating and being satisfied. They didn't all get a little itty bitty piece. You know, if you ask me, Austin, you want to have a good meal? I, you know, I would think burgers or steaks, but not, not one of those fancy places where it takes five hours and they, they bring you a little dish and you need a magnifying glass to see your food. Because you go to one of those places, you don't eat and you're not satisfied. They ate and they were satisfied. And the disciples picked up how many basketfuls left over? Twelve. Plenty. More than enough. Another religious mentality is that, well, if, if God blesses so-and-so, or if God, God blesses pastor anymore, there's not going to be enough for me. There were 12 basketfuls left over. They all ate and they were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. Some of them might say, how terrible. Young man brought his lunch, and Jesus took his lunch for others. There were 12 basketfuls left over. I know that young man had plenty to eat. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. So Jesus supernaturally fed 5,000 men plus women plus children. You know, something that comes up, people get concerned about the tithe. It's a matter of faith. And in a recent workbook, Pastor wrote, he calls the tithe, like many other things, a, a bridge of faith. So somebody gives me $100. Well, do I believe that if I bring that $10 to the house of God, do I believe that my heavenly father can replace that $10? Do I believe that he can multiply that $10? Do I believe that he can increase that $10? It is a matter of faith. So Jesus fed 5,000 men plus women and children. Then we come to Mark chapter 8. Turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 8. And we have him feeding a large crowd a second time. And this is a second, separate, and distinct miracle of provision. Number five, when you don't have enough, Jesus has compassion. He wants you to have more than enough. Why don't we say that? Say, Jesus, he wants me to have more than enough. There are, there are times I'll hear my father say, he'll say the Lord doesn't care what it costs. See, we, we have all of these mentalities and religious baggage that's not Bible. You gotta set that, set that aside. And you may not be able to afford something in the present, but Father God can't afford it. He can make a way. Mark 8, beginning in verse one, during those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. So he cared about them. He cared about their needs. He cared about who they were. He cared about where they were from. He cared about how far they had traveled. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, but where? In this remote place, can anyone get enough bread to feed them? So even with the money bag, even with enough money, in this remote place, where could they get enough bread to feed them? Verse five, how many loaves do you have? Seven, they replied. Jesus told the crowd to sit down on the ground when he had taken the seven loaves and again had done what? Given thanks. See, it's, it's contrary to human nature to, to give thanks when, when you're not where you want to be and you don't have what you want to have. It, it's contrary to human nature to give thanks in the present. But that's faith. Faith that you're not going to stay where you are. Faith that there are better days ahead. Faith that there is plenty ahead. Faith that the desires of your heart are becoming a reality. When he had taken the seven loaves and had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the, the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and they were satisfied. Now I've encouraged you to get your own Bible that you can use every day and read every day and study every day and bring to church and carry with you and, and mark it and highlight it and write it and underline it. And that's a verse I would mark. 
Verse 8, the people ate and they were satisfied. That's another religious thing that, well, we're, 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 we're not supposed to be happy. We're not supposed to be satisfied. We're not supposed to have what we want. Nonsense. They ate and they were satisfied. That's a religious mentality that we're supposed to go to bed hungry. They ate and they were satisfied. Now you can overdo it, which is gluttony. We're not going to get into that this morning. Amen. But our Heavenly Father wants our needs met, not just with enough, but with more than enough. They ate and they were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 men were present. Again, in verse four, the disciples asked about buying enough food. So, so they were not poor. They, they had resources. They had ability. Number six, in both miracles, Jesus asked the same question. What do you have? What do you presently have for me to do a miracle with? I would encourage you to go back and listen to or watch the 2022 Holy Week Revival. You have to go in the strength you have. You have to take action with the strength you have. You have to step out in faith and obey God with the strength you have. What is in your hand? That's the question the Lord is asking each of us today. Too often we're waiting on God or we're waiting on this or that. That's hope, not faith. What do you have in your hand? It's the same question God asked Moses in Exodus 4, beginning in verse 1. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said, what is that in your hand? And Moses was there on the mountain. He was tending animals, so he had a shepherd's rod or a shepherd's staff. The Lord said, what is in your hand? Doesn't seem like much. Doesn't seem like great resources, great ability. But with that staff, Moses went back to Egypt and with that staff wrought mighty miracles. And with that staff, a piece of wood led the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. They had been slaves for 400 plus years with a staff, he led them out. And so often we have this attitude mentality. Well, when I have this, when I have that, when I have this much money, when I have that much money. No, you got to obey God right where you're at. You've got to begin working the principles of God's word in the Bible right where you're at. You got to step out in faith and do what's right, right where you're at. What is in your hand? It's like the question Elijah asked the widow in 1 Kings 17, beginning in verse 13. It's a time of famine. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. She, they, she had been planning to eat her last meal and die. And uh, notice Elijah wasn't so genteel. Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said. But first, make a small cake of bread for me from what you have. Bring it to me. Then make something for yourself and your son for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up. The jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. What If you will walk with God, if you will look to the Lord as your source and as your supply, if you'll do things God's way, one way or another, God will provide. And we often get it in our minds that it has to happen this way, we often get in our minds that the only way money can come into our hands is through the job. Praise God for the job. But the Ancient of Days is not just limited to the job. He can provide in any number of ways. That's why sometimes during offerings, you'll hear my father and I rehearse that the money is coming in. One way or another, it's coming in. If it doesn't come in this way, it's coming in this way. If it doesn't come in this way, it's coming in some other way. One way or another, it's coming in. One way or another, it's coming in. And so th this is crazy. First, make a small cake of bread for me from what you have. This woman had been planning to eat her last meal. And he said, first, make a small cake of bread for me from what you have. Make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. So she did not take action 
with what she did not have. She took action with what she did have. And what happened? The Bible says in verse 15, she went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day. Why don't we say this? Say, say every day. Every day. Say it again. Say every day. And this, if you take the time, go to Luke's gospel in your study time this week, Jesus later rehearsed this during his ministry that in difficult times, God's prophets went not to the children of Israel, but to those outside the covenant. And in difficult times, times of famine, those outside the covenant received a miracle from God and had plenty and had more than enough during days of famine. And when Jesus rehearsed that, it made the crowd so angry, they wanted to put him to death. It's not a matter about your last name. It's not a matter of skin color. It's not a matter of where you grew up. It's a matter of faith in God. It's a matter of obedience. It's a matter of doing what that little boy did and putting what may be enough for you, but it sure is not enough for 5,000 men plus women and children, putting what is not enough in the hands of Jesus. It says, 1 Kings 17, she went away and did as Elijah had told her, so there was food. How much food? Every day. Why don't we say, say, every day. And see, we're, we're so blessed. We're so privileged. We can't relate to this. You run out of food. Within 10 minutes, there's Kroger's, there's Albertsons, there's Sprouts, there's all these places. See, well, we can't relate to this. We can't relate to a woman being so desperate in so much need, planning to eat her last meal and die. A time of famine when those inside the covenant didn't have enough, but she did what Elijah said do. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. In the feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children, in Mark 6, 38, Jesus asked, how many loaves do you have? In the feeding of 4,000 men plus women and children, in Mark 8 and verse 5, Jesus asked, how many loaves do you have? Jesus did not complain about what he didn't have. Well, I, I wish we had enough to feed everyone. He didn't do that. He gave thanks for what he did have. And see, this is a principle. This is a principle of faith. This is part of having a right heart and a right, mo right motives and a right attitude that yes, we're believing God and yes, we desire and, and yes, we want. And as long as those things are in line with the word of God, they're good and godly and righteous. But in the present, we're grateful. In the present, we're thankful. In the present, we give thanks. And when there is not enough, we give thanks for what we do have. And we thank Jesus for multiplying it into more than enough. Stop saying what you don't have. Stop saying what you can't do. There's no victory in saying what you don't have. There's no victory in saying what you can't do. Say what you do have in Christ. Say what you can do in Christ. Paul was in prison when he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So no more excuses. No more complaining and crying and whining. Say what you do have. Say what you can do. Be thankful for what you do have. Be thankful for what you can do. Every miracle begins with the seed. Tell your neighbors, say, every miracle begins with the C. So number seven, you've got to yield what you have to God and he'll multiply. Thinking about the tithe. You know, sometimes the enemy will lead someone down that road. Well, when my income or my pay gets doubled, then I'll tithe, then I'll give, then I'll be a blessing. No, you won't. It is a matter of stewardship. It is a bridge of faith. And what you have to do is step out in faith right where you are and yield what you have to God so he can multiply it, so he can increase it. Now, now I realize, I, I grew up in church my whole life, grew up in children's church. These are things I take for granted. 
Jessica grew up in church her whole life, grew up in children's church. You know, when she was a teenager, she would work. I know she tithed. And so if you'll have a right heart and attitude, you'll see that Father God designed the system for us to live a life of harvest. My father has a lot of trees on his property, but now he has trees that are not trees that he planted. You know, years ago, my in-laws, Jessica's parents, they had a tree in their front yard die. And because that was the only tree in their front yard, they had to call someone and select a tree and pay for a tree and have a tree planted and, and watered. That's not what I'm talking about. My father has an area of his yard where there are pecan trees growing, where he didn't buy a tree, plant a tree. He, he didn't go and buy a seed and plant a seed. But squirrels, doing what squirrels do, buried seeds, forgot about them. And now there are pecan trees that have grown up over time. And now those pecan trees are bearing fruit. That's the system God designed. Go back to Genesis 8.22. The Bible says, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest will never cease. But what people want is harvest without seed time. And that's not the way God designed the system. We all, we all want harvest, amen? But harvest requires seed time. And so if you'll turn those complaints around and see, God designed his system so that if we live a life where we're a tither, if we live a life where we're a blessing, if we live a life where we're generous, if we live a life where we're faithful in the house of God, where we're sowing all the time, so guess what's happening all the time? Harvest. We're living a life of harvest. But to get there, you've got to set aside the wrong Christian pattern. Shouldn't even call it a Christian pattern, but it's in the church world. It's a pattern of somebody doing their own thing, not being faithful in the house of God, occasionally being in the house of God, occasionally giving, and the harvest, it is very sporadic, getting jammed up in a need, then being faithful in the house of God, believing God for a miracle, there being a miracle, and then after a month or two, going back to the status quo. That is not God's best. He wants us to live a life of harvest. He wants us to live a life where we eat and we are satisfied. And so if you'll turn any complaint or criticism or objection around and have a right heart and right motive and eyes of faith to see it, God designed his system that if we would live lives of sowing like he designed the earth, we would live lives of continual harvest. Number seven, again, yield what you have to God and he'll multiply it. You got to give God something to work with and then believe God for a great harvest. In Mark 10, verse 28, beginning in verse 28, Peter said to Jesus, we left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brother or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Say, say in the present. See, that, that's another religious thing, Put it, putting all the blessings of God off until eternity. Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them, persecutions. You know, the blessing brings persecution. The blessing brings criticism. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. And somebody might say, well, Brother Austin, Jesus was not talking about the material things of this world. Nonsense. He said fields. You know, if you ask me, he said, Austin, you know, tell me 10 things you would do different. One of those things would be the first neighborhood Jessica and I lived in, there were still some empty lots. And if I could go back in time, instead of buying this car or that car, I would have instead taken that money and bought land. Because by the time we moved out of that neighborhood, it was crazy how much the price of land had gone up and increased in this area. If I had done that, I could have bought any car I wanted. So fields and land have value. So stop putting all the blessings of God off into eternity. 
And Jesus promised us a harvest. We'll fail to receive how much? A hundred times as much in this present age. Jesus confirmed that he fed large crowds on two separate and distinct occasions. Look at Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 14. Now this is just after he had just fed the large crowd of 4,000 men plus women and children. And so he had done that, he had ministered, they were going on. Verse 14, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had had with them in the boat. Now Jesus had just fed large crowds on two separate occasions and Jesus had just fed 4,000 men plus women and children and there had been seven large basketfuls left over. But verse 14, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Now, in the Bible, yeast is often used as a negative example. And so Jesus was telling them, beware the sin of the Pharisees. Beware the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. He told them elsewhere, they put burdens on people's backs they themselves will not carry. Beware of that. Stay away from that. It's like yeast. It spreads. It grows. But they were worried about bread. They discussed this with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. Now, how can you have seven large basketfuls left over and then not take enough with you for the journey ahead? Well, Jesus was traveling with a group of men. You know, if this had been a group of ladies, they would have taken some of that food. They would have had it in smaller baskets, maybe one for each person. They didn't have Ziploc bags with, you know, Sharpies back then, but they might have embroidered people's names on a piece of cloth. But Jesus was traveling with a group of men. He had just fed, there wasn't enough. He had just fed a large crowd, 4,000 men plus women and children. There were seven large basketfuls left over. They head out and all they have is one loaf of bread. And he he's trying to teach them. Beware the yeast of the Pharisees. Beware the religious hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Beware what they do and how they treat the people, putting burdens on people's backs they cannot carry. Beware of that. And they said, it is because we have no bread. Notice that they, they were thinking still about bread. Even though there had not been plenty, even though Jesus had multiplied what there was to be more than enough, they were worried about eating. They were worried about provision. They were worried about having more than enough. And this is why we have to continually return to Matthew 6 and renew our minds to the word of God, where Jesus said, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. Tell your neighbor, say, do not worry. Tell your other neighbor, say, do not worry. Some of might say, well, what if this happens? And what if the government does this? And what if the Federal Reserve does that? Do not worry, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. All we can do every day of our lives is live for God with all our heart, soul, and mind and do what's right and put God first and look to God as our source and supply and know that what God did for an outsider under the old covenant, he will do for insiders under the new covenant and we will have food every day and we will eat and be satisfied. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why? Are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see? Ears but fail to hear? Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? He answered seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Yes, it was a group of men. And yes, knowing a group of men, there was just one loaf of bread. But were they going to go hungry? See, we get it in our minds because of religion that provision is hard. We get it in our minds because of religion that the blessing of God is hard. No, God's way is easy. The blessing of the Lord is easy. It's doing it the world's way or man's way that is hard. He said, do you still not understand? 
We have to renew our minds to the word of God. Both crowds ate and were satisfied. Both crowds had plenty. Both crowds had more than enough. Mark 8 verse 8 says the people ate and they were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 men were present. The word for basket in Mark 8 and Matthew 15 is very specific. And it is a different word for basket than what is used in the Gospels when Jesus fed the other large crowd of 5,000 plus people. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls or broken pieces that were left over. The word for basket, when he fed the crowd of 4,000 men plus women and children, the word for basket here means a large hamper. You got to picture a basket large enough to hold a fully grown man. Seven large basketfuls were left over. Now picture that. The same language is used in Acts chapter 9, verse 25, when the apostle Paul's life is in danger and he has to flee the city of Damascus and the believers get him out by lowering him outside the city walls in a large basket, a basket strong enough to hold a full-size man, to lower a full-size man outside an ancient city's walls. So picture that. Seven large baskets, big enough to hold grown men. Seven large baskets were left over full, filled with plenty. Picture that. That's what God does. More than enough. And you might be at a place where the pantry is not full. There's not more than enough. You might not be in a place where when you open the fridge, what you desire is in the fridge. Thank God for what you do have. Look to him as your source. Take what is not enough, be a blessing with it. Put it into the hands of Jesus and he will multiply it and turn it into more than enough. And you will eat and you will be satisfied. And if you'll have highs, from a right heart, a right attitude, right motives to see, the tithe, being a blessing, giving above and beyond, being a good steward, that is God's system of seed time to ensure that as his people, we live lives of continual harvest. And even in days when the world does without, like that widow woman outside the covenant, we have plenty and we have plenty every day. That's his will. That's his best. Please bow your heads. You might be here today and you've heard me preach about the goodness of God and about his provision. Being a part of the family of God first begins by giving your life to him. This world we live in, it'll lie to you. It'll tell you that there are many paths to God. It'll tell you that if you're just kind of good enough, that that is sufficient. This world we live in, it'll tell you that you can come up with your own way to God. Friends, those are lies. There is only one way and one name by which we can be saved, and that is by Jesus Christ. He is the Savior of the world. Jesus said, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So being a part of the family of God begins with giving your life to Jesus. He's standing at the door of your life. He's knocking, but you have to open the door. You have to ask him to come in and be the Lord and the Savior of your life. If you're here today and say, Austin, I've never done that, but I want to. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be a part of the family of God. If that's you, wherever you're seated, raise your hand. Where I'll see it, I'll know. You want me to pray with you? Say, Austin, pray with me. That's you, raise your hand to where I'll see it and I'll know you want me to pray with you. You might also be here today and at a time in your life, you prayed a prayer, you walked an aisle, but you've not been living for God. You've been doing your own thing. And in doing your own thing, you have paid the price. Maybe you got reconnected to things from the past. Maybe there was a disappointment and instead of looking to God for help, 
you got angry or bitter at God. He loves you. The Bible says that his mercy is new every morning. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says he makes the crooked places straight. If you're here today and say, Austin, pray with me. I want to recommit my life. I want to make things right with God before I go. If that's you, wherever you're seated, raise your hand to where I'll see it. I'll know you want me to pray with you. For the sake of those watching or listening online, you might say, Austin, pray with me. Repeat this simple prayer. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I repent of my sins and I ask you to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Thank you for welcoming me into your family. Thank you for a new beginning and a fresh start. Thank you for every benefit that comes with being your child. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, watching or listening now or later, we want to be a blessing. Go to the address on the screen. We'll send you a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we'll also send you a book written by my father, our senior pastor called God's very own child. It'll help you get started in living the Christian life. Now I have a challenge for everyone here today. Some homework, some action taking. Whatever the need is in your life, you have to yield what you have to God and take action with what you do have. And I mentioned Genesis 8:22. as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest will never cease. It was showed pictures of the pecan trees at my father's. And what kind of fruit do pecan trees produce? Pecan. These are not difficult. Well, they are out there in the cold. Should not be difficult questions here in 2023. Amen. Things are confused out there in the world. But the way God designed the system, every seed produces after its own kind. And so you might say, Austin, this is an area of my life, I have a need. What you need to do is sow seed in that area of your life. You might say, Austin, the pantry is not full like I want it to be, or I don't have in the fridge what I want to have, what I, what I desire for my family. Then be a blessing with food. Be a blessing in feeding someone else's family. Maybe when you're at lunch and you see a group of police officers having lunch or men and women that have served in the military, the Lord moves on your heart to be a blessing. Buy someone else's lunch. You need clothes. You need clothes or shoes for your children. What kind of seeds should you sow? Clothes, shoes. And that's why you'll hear us say, don't wear things out. While they're still in good condition, give them away and be a blessing. So this is my homework. This is my challenge. Whatever you would say is the area of need in your life, sow some seed. Sow some seed this week and believe God for a harvest. And somebody might say, Austin, I, I need more money. Well, every seed produces after its own kind. And so if you want a harvest of finances, what are you gonna have to sow? What are you gonna have to be a blessing with? Money. And if you'll sow, you'll reap. Give, Jesus said give, and it will be given unto you. The past few weeks, Jessica was given car seats away. Now, I, I don't want a, har a harvest of car seats. Uh, I, no more, in Jesus' name. But I'll take a harvest in other areas of provision in our children's lives. Amen. We are blessed to be a blessing. Something is really wrong. You know, I understand when someone moves, they may have to store something temporarily, but something is really wrong in American society and culture when you can drive down any highway and now there are these ginormous storage facilities two stories, three stories, four stories. Maybe if we emptied those, maybe that would pay off the national debt. I don't know. We are blessed to be a blessing. And I didn't bring the, the verse, I'm not prepared with it. But to make room for the new, you first have to get out the old. To make room for the new, you first have to get rid of the old. So be a blessing and look to God to multiply 
the seed you sow and believe him for the harvest. Amen? So that's your homework assignment. And I hope your response is challenge accepted. Amen? I hope the message today was a blessing and encouragement to you.